Are binaural beats real? Do they actually have mental health benefits? So yes, binaural beats are definitely a thing. They exist, but whether or not they provide the health benefits that some people claim, let's say it remains to be seen. Now to understand what binaural beats are, we have to talk about auditory interference patterns. So if I was to play you a sine wave at 300 hertz and another sine wave at 301 hertz, you would hear a one hertz interference pattern between the two of them. One hertz means once every second. That's the difference between those two sine waves as they interfere with each other and then cancel each other out once every second. Your brain picks up on that pattern as a rhythm, as like a beating. You can hear this beating effect in intervals of a minor second or smaller if you want to go into microtonal land. If I play an E flat and a D, but then bend the D up a little bit and play the two of them at the same time, you can hear the beating effect. Now say you had a sine wave at 800 hertz and then a sine wave at 850 hertz. The interference between those two now occurs 50 times per second, which was within the audible spectrum. If you play these two notes loud enough, your ear will perceive a low 50 hertz hum, like a low bass note that's created from the combination of these two tones. These combination tones are, are kind of hard to hear sometimes, but they do exist, and we've known about them for a long time. They're originally called Tartini tones after the 18th century violinist Giuseppe Tartini. Choral singers and instrumentalists who have to play in ensembles will sometimes use these combination tones as a means of tuning, because if notes or chords are out of tune, these combination tones start popping up in these unpleasant ways, and it's a good way of making sure that the whole ensemble is locked in. Avant-garde composers like Marianne Amache and Phil Niblock use these combination tones in interesting and exciting ways to create phantom notes that don't really exist, but they do kind of exist. It's very cool. The two piercing sine waves used in an emergency broadcast alert produce a low combination tone that's attention grabbing. Note that the frequencies used in actual emergency broadcast alerts were not used in this particular video. I don't want to get fined. Thank you very much. Now binaural beats are like a form of combination tones. You get a binaural beat if you take the carrier signals of combination tones, those sine waves, and you separate them into a left and right channel and then isolate your ears so that your right ear is getting one carrier signal and then your left ear is getting the other. And by the way, you have to listen to binaural beats through headphones because otherwise they don't work. When your right ear is getting one frequency and your left ear is getting another frequency, your brain will create the auditory illusion of a beat. However, because the two signals are never interacting as audio signals, because one is just going to your right ear and the other is going to your left ear, there is no actual interference pattern. This is an auditory illusion that your brain is compensating for. The thinking goes here as far as the potential health benefits of all this stuff is that you can tune the binaural beat to whatever brain wave frequency you want to stimulate. So say you want better sleep. The neural oscillation that's associated with deep sleep occurs at the delta wave. So get yourself some sine waves and tune them between 0.5 and 4 hertz from one another. Pipe that signal into your ear balls. Your brain creates that binaural beat at the delta wave frequency, hopefully then getting you to sleep better. So the thinking goes. Now the auditory illusion does exist, but in terms of the health benefits, there is some evidence it might help, but also a lot of evidence that it doesn't. So now there are plenty of people who attest to binaural beats, positive effects on their ability to focus, on their ability to study, on their ability to relax. But I really should point out that most of the free binaural beats playlists that you can find on YouTube have not only the thrum of the carrier signals of the binaural beats, but also pretty diatonic synthesizer pads that would honestly help anybody study. You don't necessarily need the binaural beat or that low bass thrum to get you to where you need to go. I personally have experimented with binaural beats at various points in my life, and I can safely say that I, I guess they can help me relax. Most of the time it's just kind of annoying, honestly. And you know, all of the positive benefits of listening to binaural beats could also just be attributed to listening to music. In fact, there's way more scientific evidence to suggest that listening to music improves mood, improves focus, et cetera, et cetera, than binaural beats. <laughs> if you wanna to listen to binaural beats, be my guest. I don't think there's anything wrong with them. I'm not sure if there's health benefits, but hey, if listening to the equivalent of this for hours on end gets you off, who am I to stop you? Thoughts on this chord progression? C, C over B flat, F over A, F minor six over A flat, C over G, D over F, F, F minor six. So I do like this progression. I think you meant D over F sharp, if you meant D over F. 
It's a pretty spicy chord, but we'll assume you meant D over F sharp. I do like what you did with this bass line, where you reharmonize this chord progression using non-root notes to tell a little bit more of a story, like the bass line becomes its own melody. Check it out. You could keep the story going by keeping the same chords, but just choosing a different bass note for the next repetition. Like for example, and then resolving it. <laughs> you can have a lot of fun by just reharmonizing simple chord progressions with different bass notes. It's a good time. Why are we so insistent on constant BPMs? Could elastic time make a comeback? Well, of course, the reason why BPMs are so consistent is because everybody records in a digital audio workstation, and there's the metronome right there. If you're recording off of a click, time can be a little bit floaty. And I think the best example of this, the one that I always point to, is Chameleon by Herbie Hancock and the Headhunters. They start out like kind of slow, and it's, it's cool. It's like grooving. And then by the end of the performance, it's a 15 minute song, by the way, they are significantly faster than where they started. I'm not sure if this is good or bad. It's just an interesting thing that doesn't happen as much anymore because of digital audio workstations. And I think in the case of Chameleon, it's actually for the benefit of the song itself because there's so much stuff that happens over the course of these 15 minutes that it feels like the speeding up is part of the journey. But yeah, that is something to explore. Just make sure that there's like a good reason to slowly speed up over the course of a piece of music because otherwise it can feel like it wasn't intentional. Can something gridded be groovier than something played with feel? So the thing is, is that when people quantize drums or quantize bass performances or guitar performances, more often than not, they're doing it to, I hate to say it this way, compensate for lack of performance. I mean, I know for myself that I have relied on quantizing to correct for my own truly horrendous performances. But when something's really cooking and something's feeling really good and like the band's really locked in, usually in live performances where the band has been playing together for a while, I mean, quantizing will really suck the soul out of everything. Quantizing a performance is kind of like a crutch. And if you're hurt, crutches can be useful. And if you aren't hurt, they can be an impediment unto themselves. Nobody's running anywhere on crutches. Name of pentatonic scale with one major three, four, five, flat seven. I've always called that the mixolydian pentatonic scale because it's like the mixolydian scale, except it's missing its second and its sixth degree. So it sounds like this. Actually, I've just played that incorrectly. I played the flat three when I went up. And I, I always like that about the scale is that you can kind of interchange the major third and the minor third in this way, which feels very cool and very musical. Like it's the minor pentatonic scale, except with a variable third, if that makes any sense. Another source, of course, is blues. You can definitely take inspiration from the blues also with the scale. Hi Adam, have you read Musicophilia by Oliver Sacks? If so, what are your thoughts on it? Yeah, Musicophilia is great. Uh, it's a book written by Oliver Sacks, a neurologist who wrote The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat. It's a wonderful book exploring all these different musical conditions, I guess. Uh, he talks about synesthesia, he talks about perfect pitch, he talks about amusia, people who are unable to hear sound as music. Honestly, I love the book because I left it thinking, wow, there are so many different ways that people can experience music. Like this is not just a homogenous thing. There are many different ways that people can relate to this wonderful, terrible thing that we call music. Does touring ever get boring or exhausting? You ever wake up at 4 a.m. to get to the airport to only sit in traffic for a couple hours and then be super late when you get to the airport so you have to rush through security only to find that your flight has been delayed another couple of hours, which means that you probably won't make your connecting flight? Just imagine that every day for a month. So yes, touring can be exhausting, but also it's honestly amazing. And I'm very lucky and very privileged to be able-bodied because I don't know how I would do this otherwise, but 
it is something that uh, is both boring and exhausting quite frequently. What's today's sponsor, Adam? Today's sponsor, Nebula. Nebula is the creator-owned streaming service where you can watch some of my bonus videos and bonus vlogs, including Spicy Food, Spicy Jazz, a look into our DIY tour of India in 2020. All the trials and tribulations that came with touring small venues in India with nine jazz musicians. Now, Nebula is home to some of your favorite YouTube educational creators, video essays, and music creators. You got Lindsay Ellis on there with exclusive video essays, Philosophy Tube, Half is Interesting, Real Engineering. There's so many great creators there. It is a place free from the YouTube recommendation algorithm and all of the creative stresses that that might bring to creators. What this means for you, the viewer, is that you have a platform that is a great place to watch and discover quality content ad-free and also support the creators that you love. Nebula is also home to classes where Nebula creators teach useful skills that led them to be the creators that they are today. Now since I am a Nebula creator, if you click the link in the description, you can support me directly and get both Nebula and Nebula classes for 40% off annual plans, which amounts to about $2.50 a month. By clicking the link in the description or right here on the screen, right here, you're not only supporting this channel, but all the creators over on Nebula as we create a platform that hopes to engage the world in hopefully a more meaningful way. Thank you guys so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this Q&A. Uh, if you wanna watch more Q&As, you can also click this link here. And yeah. Peace.